Now today we're uh, closing up. This is the final message of our uh, sermon series on our God is dot, 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 looking at some of the attributes of God. Um, It's our last one. It's our sixth one, unless we count Brian's message from last week. If you were here last week, let's, he did a great job, didn't he? So let's, yeah. At, At some point, he probably will watch this. He's back in Canada. So that clap he'll actually hopefully get uh, when, he's, when he looks at it. But yeah, he did a great job. And Brian, if you're checking this out, pass our love on to the family and a special little Merrick. Um, let him know that uh, we continue to pray for him and uh, we, uh, we love him too. That's one of uh, Brian's little grandsons that was, when he was born, uh, they had to remove six inches of his intestines the day he was born uh, so that he could... Uh, he could live, and he is. He's doing a great job. Yeah, and now we're closing up today, like I said, with our God is loving. I thought, uh, you know, that this might be a great one to kick off the series, but as I thought more about it and I put the series together, I thought, no, you know what? This is where we need to land. This is where we need to end. Our God is dot, 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 loving. And so as we get ready to get into that, let's have a word of prayer together. God, thank you for this time in your presence. And thank you, Lord, for your word that we're going to look at today. Lord, as we look at it, we want, to, we want to be able to hear you speak to us. And so give us ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive the message that you have for us. So that as we leave here on this day, we would leave here as more than just hearers of your word but doers of your word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Is it difficult for anybody in this place to believe that God has a deep abiding love in his heart for selfless service like Mama Jo who feeds the homeless downtown or the Mother Teresa's of this world? Or is it difficult for anybody in this place to believe that God has a deep abiding love in his heart for faithful servants like Eric and Martha Stanley down in Mexico or the Billy Grahams of this world? People who have actually proven themselves through the years of service and integrity and character. Or is it difficult to believe that God has a deep abiding love in his heart for people that are right here at Life Church? Whether it's our young and energetic and dedicated staff or the dozens of dedicated volunteers and leaders who faithfully serve Christ with their gifts in this place. I think if we were to survey this crowd this day, without hesitation, I think most of us here would enthusiastically say, yes, there's absolutely no question about it. Derek, hands down. God has a deep abiding love for people like that. But I wonder... Would you and I have the same kind of reaction if somebody asked God if God had a deep abiding love for people in in his heart, for people like Hitler or Stalin or Osama bin Laden or for people like Stephen Paddock who you remember in 2017 carried out the largest mass shooting in American history where he actually killed in 10 minutes 58 people and wounded 413 in Las Vegas. Or what about sex traffickers or the drug dealers that are looking to prey on our kids? What about them? Or how many here think that God has a deep abiding love for those that are in the KKK? Or for those that are persecuted Christians around the world through rape and, and through enslavement? How many here that think that God has a deep abiding love in his heart for members of terrorist organizations? Or mothers or fathers that abuse their kids? If I were to survey us this morning, how many of us without hesitation and enthusiastically would say, yes, I believe that God has a deep abiding love for those kinds of people. How many of us would say, yes, without hesitation and enthusiastically? Hear this, as uncomfortable as those types of people make us feel, They help raise a very important question about God. And the question is this. Just how high and just how wide and just how deep is our God's love? Does it even include them? Jesus answers that question in Luke 15. 
In Luke 15, Jesus is busy teaching, and as he's teaching, gathered around him, there are those in that day that considered these people to be sinners. In other words, there are irreligious people who have questionable character, questionable integrity. They're sinners. And while Jesus is teaching, huddled off to the side is a little holy huddle of religious teachers and leaders. Religious teachers and leaders who are pointing their long, narrow fingers at Jesus and are saying things like, this man, <laughs> this man who claims to be the Son of God, God in the flesh, this man not only welcomes these despicable and ungodly people, but he actually eats with them. He eats with them and he enjoys it. He actually enjoys spending time with these ungodly people. As if to say, you know what, enduring ungodly people with questionable characters, one thing, but actually eating with them and enjoying it, well, that takes it to a whole new level. And then I can just see these religious leaders turn to one another and say, hey, guys, hey, guys, what more proof do we need? I mean, what more proof do we need to declare that Jesus is a fake? He's an imposter. I mean, there is no way in heaven and on earth that the son of the one true God would ever in a million years enjoy spending time with people like that. People who are morally and religiously corrupt. There's no way. Friends, hear this. These guys in their little holy huddle thought they had God all figured out. They thought they knew just how high and just how wide and just how deep God's love really was. And so they had God and they had God's love all wrapped up in this neat little box until, until Jesus kind of calls them over. And he calls them over and he shares three simple stories, three simple parables that open up their little box, their neat little box, and set the record straight about God and his love. Now, friends, normally what would happen when Jesus senses that somebody would be confused or they didn't fully understand the identity of God or they didn't fully understand his own identity, he would normally just tell them one parable, one brief little story that would correct their thinking. But in this case, Jesus used three. Three. Why? In my opinion, Jesus is so bothered. He is so upset with the confusion in the mind of these religious leaders about the nature and about the love of God, that he has determined that one parable wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be enough. And so he uses three in rapid fire, back to back to back, to machine gun the truth about God's love into their hearts and into their minds. Three times, three stories, boop, 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 rapid fire. The first one is about a lost sheep. In that day, of course, there were lots of sheep and shepherds in the area, and sheep herding was one of the primary industries of that day in that area. The second one's about a lost coin. And everybody here has lost something valuable, right? Some of you probably know this. You can ask my wife. This is my third wedding ring. <laughs> Not because I've had three wives. <laughs> but this is actually the third wedding ring that represents my marriage to my wife because I lost the other two. But uh, you may not have lost a wedding ring, but how many here have lost a set of keys, some wallets, jewelry? We can all relate to losing something valuable, can't we? We all can. The third little story is actually about two sons, but Jesus actually draws us into his story by focusing on the younger son, the wayward son, because what parent, think about this, what parent doesn't have a heart? For a wayward son or daughter, right? What parent? Friends, when Jesus told these three stories, they had tremendous impact on his listeners. And one of the reasons they had just such intent, tremendous impact was that these stories had three common threads, three common points that Jesus laced through each of these stories. And so this morning... This is where I want us to focus. I want us to focus on these three common threads, these three common points that run through these three stories. As we do, I believe this. I believe that if you and I are humble and if you and I are open, God is going to teach us about his love and we will be greatly impacted. Ready? 
The first common thread is this. In each of these three stories, something of great value is missing. Something of great value is missing. In the first story, the story of the lost sheep, the shepherd has 100 sheep, right? And those sheep represent his entire business, his entire livelihood. And so one of those sheep has significant financial value to that shepherd. But here it is, more than the financial value, that sheep has a great emotional value to that shepherd. You see, many shepherds in that day, over time, uh, would begin to see their sheep not as commodities, commodities to be bought and sold, but they would become pets, right? And pets often become what? Family, right? They become family. I don't know how many times I've walked into somebody's house and I've seen doors that are all scratched up, screens that are literally knocked out, and carpets that are absolute mess. And I'll see this little rover running around and I'll say to them, well, who did that? And they'll say something like, well, Rover did. Rover did. And I'll say, I don't, I don't have a dog in my house. I'm like, what? What? And they'll say, yeah, 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 he's a little tear. He's a little tear, but we love him. I mean, he's been a part of the family since the kids were knee-high to a grasshopper. Sure, he just, he ruins all kinds of stuff, many a carpet, and he's knocked out many a screen. <laughs> but we'll never get rid of Rover. He's a part of our family. <laughs> Friends, this is the way that, truly, it's the way that many shepherds felt about their sheep. I mean, think about this. When you're tw spending 24 hours a day going over mountains and coming down into valleys, when you have to risk your life defending that sheep against wild animals, it doesn't take long for that little booger to become a part of you. And so in Jesus' day, when he says that one of those sheep had wandered away, that shepherd has truly lost something that is very, very valuable and precious to him. In the story of the lost coin, Jesus introduces us to a woman. A woman who may have had only ten coins left to her name. Ten coins to represent her entire life fortune, just ten coins. Or it could have been that those 10 coins may have represented a treasured necklace. You see, because cash was such a rare commodity in that day, women often wore their treasure, their coins, around their necks. Or third, these 10 coins may have represented something that was far more romantic. And that day when a woman got married, many of them wore headdresses with 10 silver coins that had been woven into them. It was often her most valued and precious possession. Regardless, one day this woman tragically loses one of her coins. And when she does, friends, believe me, something very, very valuable and something very, very precious is now missing for her. Of course, in the third story, the father has two sons. Are there any parents here? Yeah. This father has two sons and one of them leaves the house and he's got a pocket full of money and he's got a head full of dreams, right? And as he leaves this house, he's, he goes to squander all that he has and it breaks his father's heart. It breaks his father's heart because his precious son is now lost. Friends, in each one of these three stories, Jesus, the master storyteller, skillfully paints pictures in the minds of his audience Pictures that every single one of us in that, this day and that day can relate to, right? Pictures that we can relate to. Pictures that clearly communicate that something of great value, precious, is now missing. And that something matters. It matters to the one it belongs to. Friends, that's the first point. I mean, as Jesus tells these stories, he makes it crystal clear that the lost sheep matters to the shepherd. The lost coin matters to the woman. The lost son matters to the father. And as he drives that point home over and over and over again, it must have hit like a ton of bricks on those people. I can just see them shaking their heads. And they're saying, hey, Jesus, you're talking about people. You're talking about lost people, confused people, irreligious people, sinful people, rebellious people. You're talking about people as if, as if they really matter to God, as if they're valuable.
valuable to him, as if they're precious to him, because they're his. Because they're his. Several years ago, a couple of buddies of mine went up to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan to go to a conference. We were walking through this park, and we came across this guy who just was walking towards us, and he stopped, and he started talking to us, a 37-year-old man by the name of Floyd. In five, I'm telling you, five minutes of meeting Floyd, without being introduced to him, without him knowing what any of us did, Floyd started pouring out his pain-filled heart to us. He revealed that he was homeless as of that day. He'd been sexually abused as a kid by his stepdad. He was a homosexual and he was an atheist. All of that, I'm telling you, in less than five minutes. I don't know what was going through the hearts and minds of my friends at that moment, but I know what was going through my mind. When I was listening to this atheist that I'd never met before, the Holy Spirit began to impress a message on my heart. The message is clear as anything he's ever said to me. And he said, Derek, this is no accident that you're here and that you're talking to this guy right now. It's no accident because I appointed this time. I appointed this time for you three pastors to encounter this man because this man matters to me. He's valuable to me. I created him and I love him. And to be honest, this is God honest truth. With that in my mind, I had to kind of like this knee-jerk reaction, and I shouted in my mind, but God, this guy doesn't even believe in you. Have you ever had an intense conversation with God while you're talking to somebody else? <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> and I said to God while I'm standing in front of this guy, I'm talking to God, and I said, I mean, God, God it would be bad enough if this guy was playing some religious game right now. But this guy doesn't acknowledge your existence. He's an atheist. Which in my spirit, God quickly, I'm telling you, he quickly responded and I could hear him in my spirit say, Derek, I know that. But I love him. I created him. He's valuable to me. And I'm waiting to embrace him with open arms. Friends, it was like God was saying to me, Derek, the lost sheep mattered to the shepherd. The lost coin mattered to the woman. The, the lost son mattered to the father. And this atheist matters to me. He matters to me. Friends, how many times have you and I been tempted to look at other people? Maybe they're driving down our street or, or maybe they're delivering packages to us or maybe they're serving us in some restaurant and we say, you know, I'm not sure how much that person really matters. Or how many times have you and I seen pictures of prisoners or other types of forgotten people like the homeless or poverty-stricken people in Africa or somebody who's got AIDS and we say, you know, I don't know how much that person really matters. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his word because his word says lost people matter to God. Confused people matter to God. The rich people matter to God. The poor people matter to God. The black matter, the white matter, the brown matter, the blue matter, they all matter. And you know what? So do you. You matter to God, and so do I. Now, for some of you, you're probably saying, well, if I really matter, Derek, then how much do I matter? I mean, how much do I really matter to God? And friends, that's where the second common thread in these three stories come into, into play. Jesus' second point in these three stories is that that which was lost mattered enough to merit an all-out search. That which was lost mattered enough to merit an all-out search. You want to know how much you matter? Well, when the lost sheep got lost, that sheep mattered enough that that shepherd left his other 99 in the open pasture 
And he searched and he searched and he searched and he searched high and low and far and wide. He went over bushes and and into the valleys, over rocks and over mountains. He searched and he searched and he searched until he found that one lost sheep. In the story of the lost coin, that woman lights her candle, the flashlight of her day, And she grabs her broom and she sweeps every corner. She searches every cranny. She turns that place upside down until finally she finds her one lost coin. In the story of the wayward son, there's a little bit of a different twist here. The father, knowing the heart, hear this, knowing the heart and knowing the mind of his son, decides not to go out and to force his son to return home. Instead, he decides to wait. To wait until his son comes to his senses and returns of his own accord. But friends, hear this. The implication of the text is this father does not wait patiently. He does not wait patiently. He doesn't just sit around waiting for his precious son to return. No, the implication of the text is that daily, daily that father searches the horizon daily that father goes to the end of the road daily that father looks as far as his old eyes can see and daily he hopes and he prays that today today will be the son of my the day of my son's return and so the two common threads in these three stories is this that which was missing mattered enough to merit an all-out search as the crowds listened to Jesus' story that day, I'm sure, I think about it, I'm sure they must have picked up on the, exist, the significance of the second strand. That people matter to God so much that when they're lost, when they're confused, or when they're strained, instead of condemning them from wandering away, God seeks and he seeks and he seeks and he seeks until he finds them. And if he has to go into the wilderness, he goes into the wilderness. If he has to turn on the light and turn a house upside down, he turns on the light and turns the house upside down. If he needs to walk to the end of the road and search the horizon daily, he walks to the end of the road and he searches the horizon daily. Friends, people matter so much to God. That he does whatever, whatever he needs to do to reach them and to bring them home. Now review with me just for a moment how it is that some of you are here this morning. I mean, for some of you, this may be your only day off through the whole week, right? Your only day off, and yet you're here at church, giving your time, and in many cases, you're giving your money, you're giving your service, How is it that you, that you find yourself in church this morning, you of all people, you, I'll tell you how, I will tell you how, because you matter to God, and you matter so much that over the course of your life, he has taken the initiative to seek you out, to seek you out, and that seeking has brought you here today. For some of you, it may have started many years ago. When life wasn't making any sense anymore. But there was this quiet little nudge. This quiet little nudge in your spirit saying, try God. Try God. For others of you, it may have been a tragedy or an adversity, a heartbreak, a disappointment. And after a while, you said, you know, the world just doesn't have what I'm looking for. And a voice came along and it said, try God. Try God. Others of you were just going along your merry way, weren't you? The truth is you were lost, but you were so lost you didn't even know you were lost. That's the truth. And so God, in an attempt to seek you out, put a Christ follower in your life. He may put a Christ follower in your office. He may put a Christ follower in your family, a daughter, a father, a spouse, whatever. But through that Christ follower, God began nudging you. And calling you to yourself, to himself. For others of you, it may have been a church, a pastor, a podcast, a, a television program, whatever. But you matter so much to God that over the course of your life, he has been seeking you out and calling you to come home. Friends, hear this. God doesn't call you to himself so he can pirate your life 
and exterminate your joy. No, that's not why God calls you. He calls you, he woos you, he draws you to himself because he wants to relate to you as a loving heavenly father. He wants to liberate you from the chains of sin that have bound you up. He wants to forgive you of the guilt that you struggle with. He wants to strengthen you for the challenges that await you. And he wants to transform you for the purpose that he's given you. Hear this. The fact that you're here today is proof positive that you matter to God. And that you matter enough that through the years he has been seeking you out personally. There's one more thread that Jesus weaves through his three stories. And the first thread we discovered that something valuable is missing, right? It's lost. In the second thread, we discovered that that valuable thing mattered enough to merit an all-out search. And now in this third strand, we're going to discover when this missing thing is found, there is a celebration. When this missing thing is found, there is a celebration, a cosmic celebration. Friends, this part is a really colorful and cool part of the scripture. When the, when the shepherd finds his one lost sheep, what does he do? He puts it on his shoulder, he carries it back to the fold, and the very first thing when he gets that sheep back to the safety of the fold is he throws a party. He throws a party. He calls all his shepherd buddies together and he says, hey guys, this is awesome, this is incredible. I searched and I searched and I searched and I found my one lost sheep. And so come, come and let's celebrate together. And so they do because they know the value of recovering one lost sheep. The woman loses her coin. And when she does, she's so excited that when she, excuse me, when she finds it, <laughs> finds her coin, she finds her coin. And when she does, she's so excited. She holds it up to the light and then she holds it tight to her chest. And she says, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I found my coin. I found my one lost coin. And then she calls all her lady friends together. And what did they do? They celebrate. And then, of course, there's the wayward son. And when he returns, broken and repentant, he returns of his own accord, broken and repentant. The father sees him in a distance, and he runs. He's been waiting for this day, and he runs, and he throws his arms around his boy, and he gives him a great big hug and a great big kiss, and his son tries to confess his wrongs, but his father just turns to the servant and says, go. Go and get my finest robe, the robe of honor, and put it on my boy, my boy, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and go and kill the fatted half and let's have a party to end all parties because this son of mine that was dead is now alive and this son of mine who was lost is now found. Now, of course, the older brother didn't like this, but that's another message. (laughs) Friends, throughout this series, you can't miss this strand. It's party after party after party. Why? Because in each of these three stories, there is a great celebration when the lost is found. This third point is so important that Jesus actually came right out and he says, I tell you, there is an unparalleled rejoicing. In other words, there is a celebration that extends from one end of heaven all the way to the other when one lost person finally realizes that they matter, when one lost person finally responds to God's search, when one lost person finally comes home to a personal relationship with God, Jesus says, when that happens, all of heaven, all of heaven comes to a screeching halt and there is an unbridled celebration in heaven. Now friends, I don't know about you, but that third strand, this third truth, absolutely warms my heart. It does. To think that one single individual matters so much to the God of all creation that he would bring all heaven to a screeching halt so that it could hold a cosmic celebration for that one person that comes home. It warms my heart. But you want to know what explodes it? What explodes my heart is when I personalize this truth. When I actually stop to ponder the fact that 50, hear this, 54 years ago, a little five-year-old boy 
kneeling down beside his mom, beside a coffee table in Norwood, Ohio, in a living room, brought all of heaven to a screeching halt. What explodes my heart is when I ponder that 54 years ago, when I asked Jesus Christ into my heart for the very first time, God put a banner up in heaven with my name on it, and all of heaven, from one end of heaven to the other, all of it broke out, broke out in an unbridled celebration for me, for coming home to him. Friends, when I personalize that third truth, and I ponder how much I really matter to God, it explodes my heart. What about you? If you're a believer, the moment you bowed your heart to Jesus Christ, whether it was last week or last month or in the last decade, whenever it was, the moment you bowed to receive Jesus Christ personally, the moment you realized that you mattered to God and you turned and repented and you asked for forgiveness and you pledged your love and loyalty to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, at that moment... There was an unbridled party in heaven for you. For you. And there is a banner in heaven with your name on it. If you're a believer, please take that truth home with you today and ponder it. Bask in it. Let it seek to the very deepest regions of your heart until it explodes there. Why? Because here's the truth. Some of you believers are still running around trying to establish whether you really matter to anybody or not. It's true. I mean, the truth is, some of you, if you're not being asked out on a date or if people don't think you've got the greatest personality or the greatest intellect or the greatest body or the greatest abilities or whatever, you walk around with your head bowed down, don't you? Well, I guess I really don't matter to anybody. But friends, God says you matter. You matter, he says, because I love you. That's why I searched you out, he says. That's why I sent my, only, my one and only son to die for your sins. That's why I caused all of heaven to come to a screeching halt when you put, and put your name on a banner to throw you a party when you came home. That's why I'm preparing right now a home for you in heaven and that's why someday he says, I'm going to return and I'm going to give you a resurrected body and we're going to live together forever. Why? He says, because you matter to me. You matter to me. And I want that truth, he says, to penetrate and captivate every single cell in your body. Why? So that even in the day-to-day -day affairs to life, hear this, so that even in the day-to-day -day affairs of life, you might pause and you might say, oh God, oh God, I really do matter to you, don't I? I really do matter to you. Yeah, I may not matter to many other people, but God, I matter to you. I matter to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I matter to the creator of all that is. I matter to you and you proved it. Which is why, friends, once you and I experience God's love, once we experience God's love personally, and we know we matter, we're compelled, aren't we? We're compelled to reach out and share that good news with others. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says that Christ's love compels us. It compels us. In other words, once you and I experience Christ's love for ourselves and all that that brings to us, we can't contain it. We can't contain it. We're compelled we're compelled to share with others. And that's why we gave you all those fun little invite cards so you could share that opportunity with others, to partner with us to be able to share that with others. But hear me, if you're still searching, if you haven't experienced Christ's love for yourself, hear this, if every single cell in your being doesn't scream, that I matter to God. Then I want you to look me straight in the eye right now.
I want you to look me straight in the eye because I want to give it to you straight. As a spokesman of God, as an evangelist, as one who declares the good news, hear me and hear me well, you matter to God. You matter to God more than you will ever understand in this world, but you matter to God because he loves you. Because he loves you. Now I know the truth is that some of you who are wrestling with this may not even know if God exists or not. But I'm here to tell you from personal experience, from the authority of God's word, that God not only exists, but that you matter to him. And he loves you. And because he loves you, he has been searching you out. And right now, with arms wide open, he is beckoning you to come. Beckoning. And his agenda for you is wonderful. He wants to relate to you as a compassionate father. He wants to embrace you and transform you. He wants to liberate you from your sin. He wants to give you abundant and eternal life with new purpose and new meaning and new direction. Some of you are ready to do that today, aren't you? You're ready to say, okay, Lord, today's my day. Today's my day. I'm going to give you right now my heart. I'm going to throw myself into your wide open arms of love, and I'm going to receive your forgiveness. Today is my day for you to take my life and make it whole. Today is my day to open up my heart and say, forgive me. Today is my day to walk with you from this day forward. Friends, if today is your day, then what a great day it is. Because a banner will go up in heaven with your name on it, and a cosmic celebration will begin. Three parables, three simple truths that help each of us know that our God is loving. Let's pray. Lord, I believe this to the bottom of my heart because your word teaches it, that you pursue us. That when this world was created, it was a beautiful place, but then something happened. There was what we call the fall, where sin entered the world and this beautiful place and we ourselves became broken. We became separated from you. But because of your great love for us, Lord, you couldn't stand that thought of being separated from us. And so you sent your son to redeem us, to buy us back. You sent your son to retrieve the lost. And Lord, it's not just about no longer being lost. It's about the celebration. It's about the restoration. It's about being put back into our original condition of right relationship with you, right relationship with others, right relationship with ourself, and right relationship with creation. You want to restore us. You want to make us whole. And so God, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the love that compelled you to pay the price for us so that we could become a part of your family and we could be reformed and reshaped into your image. And all God's people said, amen.